it's just that it's... Okay, so let's start. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a beautiful place and it's a, um, it's, it's a great conference after the pandemic to, to meet everybody, all of you again. Um, and so um, what I want to tell you is actually about microwave photons, but it, it's, it's even a bit more general. Um, so we gave it the, the, the very broad title, Universality of Photon Counting Below a Local Bifurcation Threshold. But I will explain it, what it means in, in terms of uh, microwave. Um, and uh, most of the work has been done by Lisa Arndt, who is also in the audience. Um, so if you have any questions, I most likely will refer to her. Um, okay, so this is very old physics, what I'm going to talk about. And uh, it's so old that there's actually commercial, um, you find on Wikipedia, a yeah, new amplifier battles noise. It's not so new anymore. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like, I don't know, 60, 70 years old. Um, but yeah, so Bell Labs figured out that there's certain kind of amplifiers which have much better with uh, noise. Um, and some of the reasons is that it's actually energy conserving. So you can actually implement it also as a quantum process. Um, but what it does, it changes the frequency of the radiation. So in our, you know, our view of actually looking everything in terms of photons, um, what this device does, it takes one photon and produces two photons out of it. Yeah. Um, and so there are different cases how you can do this. I mean, one case which is called degenerate is you take a photon and you split it up into two photons with the same frequency. That's called degenerate. Um, and then there's non-degenerate cases. And the non-degenerate cases is the same process, but you split it up into two photons with different frequency. Now you might wonder what's so special about two. You could also do three or four or something, and there will be talks today about this uh, uh, other cases. For my talk, uh, we, we actually restrict to the two photon case. Um, and so the question is, what happens if you have a, have a process like that? Um, and that's actually, I mean, on a classical level, it's something which is called uh, spontaneous oscillation. So I'm just looking at the degenerate case. Yeah? So I take one photon and produce two. So the classical equation of motion which does this is a harmonic oscillator, and then it's parametrically driven. Yeah? And so you change the resonance frequency in a periodical fashion. And the simplest case where you actually want to produce out of two omega, single omega, you actually drive it with two omega. So that's a drive frequency. And if you solve this equation and you look at the stationary state, what you actually see, you, you plot your driving strength and here the amplitude, that you know, the system has a solution with no amplitude. And that's a very natural stationary solution because there's damping on top. And then you start driving stronger, 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 and at some point it spontaneously oscillates. Yeah? And there are actually two solutions, one with plus and one with minus, and there's a certain phase locking. And this part actually is classical physics, so we're not interested in that. And um, so what we're interested in is actually what happens down here. Yeah? So this is the sub-threshold. Um, and there's stuff, also stuff which you heard uh, before in the talk before, there's a quantum emission of photons, squeezing, entanglement, all that stuff happens down here. Um, so for my talk, we actually concentrate on this region below, and we actually try to stay close to the threshold, but there's a little window where we're not allowed to work in. And this little window, I think, is very interesting, but for this talk, we'll actually neglect that. So that's where nonlinearities are important. And the question for this talk is, what is actually the photon counting down here? You have a system like this, and you try to look at the number of photons that comes out of the device. Um, and Chipran is actually looking at me because he knows that uh, this has been solved a long time ago. Um, it's actually uh, his work, um, which I now present. So the whole thing has actually started with an experiment where I think some people in, in this room are actually part of. Um, so this is an experiment in Sackle, where actually here's the voltage. And the voltage actually acts in these Josephson devices. So the device is such, you, you apply a DC voltage, you have a chosen junction, you have a harmonic oscillator. And this chosen junction is actually the parametric drive on this harmonic oscillator. Um, and in chosen junction, it's such a way that actually the driving frequency is set by the DC voltage, that's the AC Josephson effect. And so this is very easy because you can actually chew, uh, easily tune the driving frequency. And so the, the frequency of the oscillator is fixed and then at some point, you know, you get kind of emission of light, and then if you double the voltage, you get also emission of light. And that's this spontaneous down conversion. So once we saw this, we actually tried to do some theory. So it's with Yuli Nazarov and Ciprian. Um, and we actually looked at the counting of the photons. Um, and now, you know, given the last talk, we have to be very careful what we mean by counting. So, so the idea what we have is actually that we um, take a time window, which is very, very long, 
and we accumulate all photons which occur right in this time window. And that's our observable. Yeah? So it's not time resolved in that way. And, and how you count the number of photons, I don't care. You can count the energy that has arrived over the full time or whatever. There are different ways of actually doing it. But you take a very long time window, and the reason why you do that is because then stuff becomes universal. Um, and what we actually figured out is that there's kind of something which is called the counting statistics, whose derivative gives you the, uh, the cumulant. So the cumulant for you is just, the, the first cumulant is just the average number of photons that arrive, and the second cumulant is the variance, and then it's kind of generalizations of this idea. So the, the, the counting function actually tells you about the cumulants by just taking derivatives. Um, and what we figured out is the counting function has this very simple and neat form. So this is kind of the damping. This is the measurement time. So this is just the number of photons and all cumulants are proportional to how long you measure. That makes sense. And here the delta actually tells you how far away from this uh, onset of spontaneous oscillation you are. Yeah? So this is how close you are to a threshold with your drive. Usually you're below. Um, and chi is the counting function. Okay. So this was a calculation back in the days. It's already 10 years ago. Um, and so what's the story, the new story now? Um, yes, so we looked at this case. So that was the case where we drove with twice the frequency and out comes two photons with half the frequency. And then some years later, we looked at the, this other case, the non-degenerate case. Yeah. So that is you drive and then you have two oscillators with two different frequencies which add up to the full frequency. Um, and you know, historically this is wrong. This is a paper that came out this year. But yeah, people also look at micro mazes where you drive a current through that and then their photons emission this transmission line, you kind of tunnel coupling your double dot system. So there are different systems which you can do the calculation. And all the systems have in common that you start driving and you drive stronger and stronger and stronger. And at some point you get this classical bifurcation. And the question is about the photon statistics below that classical bifurcation. And what turns out is the answer is always the same. Yeah. So it's always the same answer. So now this might look surprising to some of you, or it might look not surprising, but that's just a fact, yeah? So the parameters, this is a microscopic parameter, which just tell you, you know, what's the probability, what's the rate of photons in, in this line, the delta is how far detuned you are, and the chi is just the counting field. Yeah? So it's always the same function. And, you know, the, the systems are sufficiently different that you might wonder what's the reason why this is the case and what's the theory behind that. And that's what I'm going to tell you. So we tried to extract universal physics from this. No? And um, I also wanted to show some experimental results. So this is something which I got. This is from optics. Yeah? So they actually looked at the, at the spontaneous down conversion and they calculated something which is G2, which is a bit more information than what you've shown before. G2 is just the probability you find a photon after you actually detected a photon before. So it's a correlation of photons. Um, and the G2 in all the systems look like this. Yeah? has a peak and it has a kind of two parameters. One is the width of it and the other is the height. Yeah? Um, and so what you realize is that there's one parameter which is the correlation time, which is the width of this uh, peak. And the other is kind of the number of photons in the cavity. That's kind of proportional to the height. It's not really the height, but it's proportional to the height. And they are dependent on a single control parameter delta. You don't have more control parameter if you're close to the threshold. Um, and then you realize that actually both of them diverge close to the threshold. So the, the correlation time diverges, that's just a hallmark of a non-equilibrium phase transition. Yeah? Because above the phase transition, I mean, you just don't relax to a single state anymore. That's why you suddenly produce two states, two equilibrium states, where before you had like one stationary state. Um, and the second is the number of photons. You kind of get more and more photons in, in the cavity until you produce these uh, coherent states, which corresponds to the spontaneous oscillation above the transition. Now, if you have uh, both of them diverging, that's really the perfect place to do a quasi-classical description of the problem. Yeah, you have many, many photons, and the, and the dynamics is very, very slow, so you can do quasi-classics. So that makes it already much, much, much more simple, no? because, I mean, for me, quantum mechanics is always this complicated theory. Something which is quasi, forget classical, that's, that's kind of simple. Yeah? And then we can connect it to something which has been studied very, very often, which is uh, the dynamics um, of, 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 of 
so, so what, you know, one is the equilibrium phase transitions, and then you look at the dynamics of all the parameters close to equilibrium phase transitions, yeah, and which we, what we do in this talk is actually connect um, this non-equilibrium uh, system to the, the theory of uh, dynamics in equilibrium phase transitions. Okay. Good. So, I mean, I just give you an example. So what I claim is that, you know, the physics here, close to the phase transition but below, um, is actually described by something which is called the Glauber model, which is in Hohenberg helping classification is called model A. Okay, I don't know who came up with these names, but that's how it is. Model A just means also the most basic model. Good, it's good. Um, so it's purely dissipative dynamics in the rotating frame. So I, I, I write down an equation of motion for the amplitude of the oscillation. So, it, I mean, it's kind of damped down, and there's some force applied due to the fact that they're kind of driving. And then there's noise, yeah? Um, and the noise is just there because of fluctuation dissipation theorem. And in the rotating frame, it has this famous factor 2n plus 1. And I would claim this plus 1 is the only place where quantum mechanics appears in all my talk. Um, okay, and, and, you know, this, this is a stochastic classical differential equation, there's an uh, equivalent description in terms of actions, which is called Martin C. Charo's action, this is maybe for the experts. So, so there you replace the noise with something which is a tilde, a second field, and that's actually conjugate. So you kind of get quantum mechanics in these uh, classical stochastic systems. But that's not so important for my talk. And then the question is how you count, yeah? And the counting is actually quite sim uh, simple. First, the ordering of the operators doesn't really matter. I mean, it took us some time to realize that, but uh, the ordering doesn't really matter. You have a large number of photons, yeah? so normal ordering is completely irrelevant. And then the amplitude squared just gives you the number of photons. There's some kind of conversion factor. Um, and, and the alpha, which appears here, is something like the fine structure constant. I failed to point out that's kind of the characteristic impedance which you have in your circuit, uh, which uh, compared to quantum impedance, which tells you how to convert. So you have this action here, and then you add just another action which, which accounts for the counting, and that's your complete action. Yeah. Um, and you know, maybe you're saying, yeah, okay, this is magic, yeah? And often physics, is, especially theoretical physics, is magic, but you want to connect it to kind of basic fundamental physics, so you have a system in mind, and this you can do. And this will be the most technical slide of my talk. Yeah. So if you really, really want to describe this system, yeah, you will start with some quantum mechanical evolution of an, you know, of an open system, which is density matrix dynamics. Um, you will have forward and backward propagation. That's what density matrices do. Um, then, for example, I mean, you can do different things. You can do Lindblad and stuff. But we, we, we try to do always uh, Keldish because it's easiest to do the, the semi-classical or quasi-classical limit. Um, you write it down in terms of a path integral, where one describes this forward propagation, the other side describes this backward propagation, so it just gives you the plus and a minus. And then these different components have different terms. Um, so, for example, the chosen junction is something which one calls Hamiltonian dynamics, and it's just on the forward contour and the backward contour, it's just minus of each other. It's just what, what these Hamiltonians would do here. Yeah? And then there are some other terms which describe this uh, damped harmonic oscillator, which is essentially caldera legate. Yeah. You can look it up there. Okay. And then we have to do rotating wave approximation. This, this Glauber dynamics was in the rotating frame. Yeah. We have to do rotating wave approximation. So we describe a, a complex amplitude. And then we do a semi-classical approximation. And that's the fact that there's slow dynamics and, and large number of photons, which means the plus equals approximately minus. Yeah. And, and then everybody who has worked a little bit on this already realizes how the Martin Sitcher Rose action comes out. Yeah, you expand in the difference between the two. Um, and then the sum of them is what's called classical, that's just the amplitude. And the difference is, is this tilde field, um, which I introduced before. So that's, that's the simple way how you would derive this, which I first just presented as a, as a result. Yeah? And you can do this for each system again. And what I'm telling you, the action that comes out in this limit will always be the same because it's essentially constrained by symmetry. There's no other terms which you can write down in terms of symmetry. Okay, so now we settled on the, on the model. The question is kind of what kind of force we put in there. 
And the forces you can put in there is also pretty classified and universal. Yeah? So we had this damping. We had this fluctuation dissipation noise, which was just the fact that we radiate out of the system. The question is what kind of force acts on our system. And the forces are also kind of classified. Yeah? Um, you can kind of, uh, you know, at, at this onset of the instability threshold, the amplitude is small. You kind of do a Taylor expansion, and then at some point you stop. No? And uh, you should stop better at, at something which is nonlinear. And then the question is which terms you take. So the x squared you can actually remove by some kind of proper uh, um, shift of variables. And then you have this model in general. Yeah. And that gives you just this cusp catastrophe. And you can read up in this, this book, right, if it's the case. Um, and so what we were looking so far is just when we, when we have an additional symmetry between the plus and the minus amplitude, and that actually constrains our b to be zero. That would just be we move here really on the, on the zero line through the cusp. Yeah? That's what, what we were looking at. Then you get this pitch bark bifurcation. And we were looking at this region down here. Um, in general, and I will ex explain you later, um, we could apply additional a coherent drive just a coherent current on the top. And then we would go here, would add this term B on top. Um, and then it looks different. So here is like one stable state becomes into one unstable and two stable states. Here's one stable state continuous. And then there's an unstable unsta separating from something else. So there's a high amplitude oscillation and low amplitude oscillation, which appear simultaneously. And this is called fold because it's like folding a paper. And this is called pitchfork because it looks like a pitchfork. Okay, so now we have our model together. I mean, there's just one step which I would like to do. So instead of A tilde, I multiplied with alpha, yeah? such that the commutation relation is not one, but uh, alpha. And, and you know, then the action has this one over alpha in each of the terms, and that's nice. So every theoretician sees an action with one over alpha in each of the terms, now it tries to do small alpha expansion, and then you just limit it by the saddle point. So we can actually you know, look at the different cases and, and kind of, uh, you know, this is counting, this is the dynamics, and we can do the, the saddle point dynamics. And what we actually see is that it's essentially classical dynamics with a kind of a strange Hamiltonian. That's what we get. Um, and then classical dynamics, we, we all know. I mean, we, we had our classical mechanics lecture, uh, so it's kind of a, a funny Hamiltonian. And then you can look at it at the saddle points and what you actually see at the Pitchburg, everything is dominated at small amplitudes, which is also obvious. And then, and then the whole picture looks a bit com more complicated for the fold. But I mean, this integral you can do, it's just technical. And you do it in the saddle point approximation, you do the integral and out comes the cumulative generating function. Okay. So what I claim, this is the, the universal cumulative generating function for the statistics close to one of these cusps. Um, there's the first term which we've seen before, which was essentially also known in the literature. And then there's a second term which comes if you kind of, you know, break the symmetry of the cusp. Um, that goes with D, which is kind of the deviation here from, from this cusp, um, D squared. And here there's a fine structure constant inside. Um, otherwise there's only delta, yeah? And of course the detuning, B and A. So the A detuning is just included in the delta. Okay, and there's a little, little, little regime which we are not allowed to use our theory because the fluctuations become so large that we actually uh, are not allowed to do this semi-classical approximation. And then you can actually calculate the cumulants and how you do that, you can ask Lisa, I don't know. I mean, there's kind of double factorial and stuff like that appearing. Um, it's complicated, but yeah, so it also has two terms. Uh, and the first term corresponds to the pitchfork, and the second term corresponds to the fold, and we just add up in the cumulant. And, and what you actually have, if you're in a, in a generic place here, you actually have a crossover. Yeah? So for large detunings, the, uh, the pitchfork dominates. If you're somewhere here, you kind of feel mostly the pitchfork. And then for smaller detuning, then you start feeling the fold. Um, and, and then that very, very small detuning you're not allowed to use our theory anymore. So that's the way it goes, yeah, and this is an expression. And you see that actually at small, fine structure constant, you can really separate these regimes from each other. And the theory is anyway only valid at small, fine structure constant. Okay, 
how many minutes do I have? Ten. Ten. Okay, good. Good. Now, what you can actually see here is already the fact that there's some kind of divergence of all the cumulants um, when you get close to the threshold. That's also what, what is expected. Yeah? At some point, it will not really diverge, nothing diverge, but that's this little shaded region which are not allowed to use the results. But otherwise, it's actually divergent. And, and the way it diverges is very much similar to critical exponents in equilibrium phase transitions. Yeah, these this, this exponents are universal for each of the cumulants. Now we have more than just second cumulants. Yeah, equilibrium phase transitions, they're always Gaussian. Yeah. Here, the stuff is highly non-Gaussian. Um, and, uh, okay, I have to click through. And you see that the, actually the divergence of each of the cumulants is actually given with a certain critical exponent. And, and they are different for the Pitchberg bifurcation and for the fall bifurcation. So whether you have additional dissymmetry between plus and minus amplitude or not actually changes the, the critical exponents. But it's not depending on the system which is on the basic of it, no? I mean, I've shown you three systems which all show the same critical exponents. And then, for example, you can look at the Fano factor. And this is quite interesting because the Fano factor tells you how many photons are correlated with each other. And both of them, the final factors is also diverging. And what it actually tells you if you look at it in details is that there are more photons correlated that they're in the resonator at a single instant of time, yeah, which is maybe counterintuitive. But the whole system tries get, to get into this coherent state, so it loses a few photons and new come in, and they kind of feel this coherence which is already built up. Yeah. So you have more photons correlated than they're in the, in the resonator at a single instance of time. And the other thing is, this is actually, you know, this would be the dynamical critical exponents, like how does the time scale diverge with your parameter in the system? And that's actually one in both cases, yeah. And we believe it's kind of quite universally one. This is just, uh, I mean, you have the photon current and you look um, uh, how, how long you need to, to actually produce the, uh, this number of correlated photons. Then there's other stuff which you can look, which is universal. One of it is rare event statistics. I told you it's completely non-Gaussian, the statistics. Yeah? So the first two cumulants don't tell you uh, everything. And we all know that measuring higher cumulants is kind of complicated. What often is much more simple is actually looking at extreme events. Yeah? You kind of do a threshold detection and see when, when, when I don't know, uh, your signal actually goes beyond a certain threshold. And then this, what you see is actually probability to see certain extreme rare events, and it's actually logarithmic. Yeah? So it's, uh, the Gaussian is just this parabola, uh, the dotted behind. And the fault bifurcation is twisted towards the higher um, and the pitchfork even more. Yeah? So they are, they're more and more twisted. You can also see it at cases. So in, in the pitchfork case, um, you actually uh, essentially don't get any probability for zero signal. Yeah? Whereas in, in the fault case, you get a constant probability for zero signal. So they're kind of more twisted towards the side. And the same thing on the right side. On the right side, is a factor four in the logarithm, yeah? So it's, uh... okay, so about potential implementation, maybe that's uh, of interest to some of you. So in this community, again, I mean, the physics is very generic, but in this community, this is the best setup which we could have come up, yeah? Again, DC biased, Josephson junction, um, a resonator, and some detector somewhere. Um, the alpha which we had is just, uh, um, the fine structure constant is just the characteristic impedance, it should be small, and, and kind of we want a high quality uh, resonator. Then the parametric resonance is set by the voltage. So the voltage set as the frequency here, yeah? and we have to set the voltage equal to omega, such that one Cooper pair produces two excitations in the photons. Yeah? And, um, and then the driving strength is, is just this chosen energy, which you can tune by split choices and junctions. Um, and now the other axis is actually an additional coherent drive. And you have to apply it properly that it's actually in phase with, with the oscillation that wants to, to be built up. Yeah? So you have both axes under control and then you can measure and you can detect the statistics. Yeah? I'm, actually, oh, I'm actually already finished even though the, the, uh, the chairman says I'm five minutes left, but that's good. So what I actually showed you is that uh, there's a generic characteristic function of the photon counting. And it's based on the universality of, you know, Hohenberg 
helper in classification. And we believe it actually can be generalized in all kinds of directions. I mean, you know, these things can be done in 1D, which would be chains of, uh, of these kind of devices. Um, the fold and the pitch bifurcation lead to different critical exponents and different final factors, but can be tested in a single device. So this whole thing can be done in this device. And so we propose a concrete microwave setup. For more information, you have to read this paper or talk to Lisa or me. Um, and I just want to announce something. This blue region, which is very, very narrow, is highly interesting. And we believe it's also universal, even though it's actually less, I mean, here this thing is actually extremely universal. Yeah? So the many, I mean, nobody would see a degenerate and a non-degenerate amplifier would produce the same statistics. Yeah? Um, so we, we believe that there's also some universality in this regime and we're working on that. And, uh, but we don't have results yet. We have good indications that it will work out and there will be a paper hopefully this year coming out. So if you're interested in that, you have to wait for that. Okay, I want to thank for your attention. So um, my question is about rare events. So mm -hmm. uh, I wonder to what extent the statistics of rare events is universal. Because your universality is based on an expansion, mm -hmm. right? And if uh, you have a rare, strong event, then you are beyond uh, the, the expansion region. You're absolutely right. And that's maybe even something which we would have to refer. No, I think you're ab absolutely right. If you kind of go far away, at some point you expect that other physics set in. Yeah. But what I'm trying to claim is that as long as the fine structure constant is small, <laughs> that this, it's kind of a crossover thing. So as long as the fine structure constant is small, then these nonlinearities or something else set in a very, very far point. And if you kind of, at some point you see a deviation. And if it's too early, you have to kind of lower your characteristic impedance. And we can figure out at which point it sets in. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't done so. So uh, two questions. One is about uh, lasing and synchronization. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, I guess they have, they start out with a slightly different system in the sense that they're driving maybe not always parametrically. And there they talk about uh, um, looking for complex eigenvalues and maximizing, uh, well, minimize, minimizing the loss in an imaginary time sort of perspective and leading to synchronization. So it, it, it seems complementary to, to this. Yes. And I was wondering uh, if there's uh, maybe a, a deeper insight. And the second question was about the rare events and what would be the, is there something non-Gaussian in the, in the quantum squeezing uh, that we can measure? What, what would be the signature exactly there? Yeah. So one thing is, yes, in optics they use mostly Lindblad formulation and there's a mapping and we can figure it out. And, um, and we believe the lasing transition is, is actually also in this universality. Yeah? Um, and there's, for example, here this curtain is and, and then Keeling. They looked at the Dicke transition and it's the same. Okay, so I think the statistics away, f um, away from the, the blue region will depend much more on the details. It's still universal, but less universal. But this kind of <laughs> further away is kind of extremely universal. That's my feeling. It's kind of, we were sad that it's so universal, no? Um, but yeah. And the second question was about uh, the non-Gaussianity. I mean, what you have to really detect, and you know, this depends on your setup, or you have to detect that, that, the, that it's not, I'm not sure in which direction I'm going. Uh, you have to detect, you see, it's a logarithm of the probabilities. So you have to really detect rare events and you have to figure out whether it's a parabola, that's Gaussian, or it's not a parabola. Yeah. And so best is kind of detect a few events up here to get the curvature. Um, I mean, the curvature you can also get via noise. Yeah? You do a noise measurement and an average measurement, then you know the parabola which should be, and then you try to detect some points out here and see that it's not on the parabola. And by that, you kind of show non-Gaussianity of the thing. Yes. Thinking in the analogous with the statistical uh, physics, when you are talking about uh, universality, you usually uh, get universality 
from the symmetry of the model that is broken at the transition. Uh, can I think in this way? And if this is the case, can I think that you exponent are the mean field exponents? So first, mean field exponents, in some sense, these are the mean field exponents of the non-natural equilibrium phase transition. That's why it's maybe so universal, yeah. So what we are doing is essentially the mean field theory because it breaks down close to the, to the threshold where fluctuations become important, yeah. So that's why we're working on, on the other part. The other thing is that uh, um, it's, it's kind of universal and uh, it, this model A is extremely universal. I mean, so if you go through the fault, then th that's, that's without symmetry, essentially, here. That's essentially without symmetry. And if you go through here, you have this additional symmetry that, you know, plus amplitude and minus amplitude are the same. That forces you to go along that line. So there's kind of one symmetry on top, yeah. But you're right, we're doing just mean fields. But it's not an equilibrium, so I claim it's a bit more complicated than just mean field. Any other question? So in the experiment, um, were you saying that we would need to be able to count the number of photons in the, in the last experiment you said, like in, in some time interval, or is it enough just to, you, you count was the, the P of I, was that just, was I intensity? Or I, I said photon currents, the number of photons right. per time, which you can count by photons or by energy or by, you know, whatever. You can also measure the quadratures if you want. I mean, you right. see, the, the, the fun thing is if you count for a very long time, it essentially doesn't matter how, how you count it. Yeah, you have okay. to accumulate all the signal over the long time. Yeah, so so there's nothing specific here. Yeah, the I is just a photon current because the number of photons will be proportional to time. You divide them by each other, you get the I. Yeah, that's, that's, I call right. it photon yeah. current. Yeah, so basically it could be just the power. It can be power. Um, as a function of time. Power, yes. Um, and, and the power, of course, has some kind of normalization, which is the energy of the mode. Right. And then it would be the I. Yeah. Okay, so you don't necessarily need a bolometer, but you could measure it with the bolometer, but you could also measure it from the quadratures, like you said. You can measure it by the quadratures. No, at some point we enter the stuff which I have been discussing with many people, like, do we need a measurement theory for all this? I don't know. I haven't seen anything that we need more than this kind of Keldish something, but uh, if you measure something which doesn't fit with the theory, then we have to look more carefully. Right. Um, I, I guess you mentioned this already, but I'm just thinking that, for example, our barometer has quite a lot of noise. I mean, mm -hmm. the energy resolution is less than, you know, a usual microwave photon that we are, we are looking at. But on the other hand, I guess you said that if you have noise on top, you could kind of try to just measure the noise and... But, you know, there's so many photons coming out. Uh, the reason why I do quasi-classics is because it's essentially tons of photons coming out. So we really, you go, I mean, you have to design it in such a way, you're not going <laughs> to detect single photons necessarily. Yeah? Right. But you have to accumulate the number of photons over time. So, so in that sense, it would be good for a bolometer not to lose the energy too fast that you kind of accumulated over something. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about the width of that distribution. If I have noise this on one? top. This one? Yeah, if I have noise on top and if the, now the noise is broadening that a lot. Yes, but somehow. you see the width is given by the average signal. Okay. So make the average signal larger. Yeah. Um, could you just uh, explain, you said on the, the other side of the bifurcation, mm -hmm. it's classical and mm -hmm. it's not interesting. And yeah, the, the threshold also you? has, I mean, there's an interesting physics on both sides of the threshold, yeah? So this, this blue dashed line comes below and above, but then at some point it becomes uh, Poissonian or whatever. Okay, so I think we can thank uh, Fabian again.